People's Tribunal on Sri Lanka, an interview with Mr. Viraj Mendis. People's Tribunal on Sri Lanka. The third session of the Tribunal on Sri Lanka. The first session was held in Dublin in Ireland and the second was held in Bremen in Germany and the third session will be taking place under aegis of permanent people's tribunal between 20th and 22nd of May in Berlin, Germany. With 30 leading human rights activists from Asia, Africa, Europe and Latin America will engage in the tribunal virtually in a manifestation of people-to-people -people solidarity. The aim is to bring to the light the results of the first two sessions of the tribunals. The panel of judges for the Berlin session is a reflection of this reality. As we see a confrontation developing between two sides of the geopolitical divide as to who controls this strategically important island while its economy collapses, the Ulam Tamils in the homeland and diaspora will find their deliberations at the tribunal very intrusive. The discussions at the Berlin Tribunal will not only be of concern to the Ulam Tamils, but to all those concerned in peace through negotiations. To discuss this tribunal, we have Mr. Viraj Mendes, human rights activist, who is part of the International Human Rights Association in Bremen, Germany, who has been tirelessly working on these sessions to bring about the truth, justice and peace to the Tamils. On behalf of the ILC Tamil radio listeners, may I welcome Mr. Viraj Mendes to the show. Good evening. Thank you for having me. I'm very grateful for you to come on the show to talk about this tribunal and um, I would like to start by asking you a very simple question. What is the significance of this tribunal? Yeah, I mean, this is the, as you know, it's the third of the tribunals. This tribunal, we want to, uh, I mean, to take the decisions of other two tribunals to make it a little bit more effective, for it to have an effect in the world a little bit more than the other two. I mean, in, in the other two, we, especially the second tribunal uh, in Bremen, we did sort of exhaustively sort of prove that actually genocide has taken place, right? And also that, that the Americans and the British have been complicit in the genocide, right? But there is a problem in the sense, you know, why is the genocide not accepted in the world, right? Is it because hard to prove that it's genocide or is there another reason, right? So it's in this context that we are doing this new tribunal because it's, it's to ask the question also, why is the genocide not accepted? There's a reason for that as well. So, and we want to sort of have the people who are accepting that it's a genocide Right? Who are the people who are accepting it's a genocide and who are the people who are not accepting it's a genocide? We are trying to mobilize the people who are near to accepting it, who have in their interest to accept it, right? In, in other words, people who are nearest to us, right? And not to worry so much about the people who are furthest away from us, right? So it's in this sense that the, that the judges in this tribunal from Latin America, from the indigenous people's organizations and, and organizations like that who are open to understanding what we are trying to say. You just mentioned that um, the genocide, with all this evidence and the satellite footage, in mm -hmm. your opinion, you have been working on this project for a number of years now. Mm -hmm. Why do you think that perception around the, the Western world that they are reluctant to accept that there was a genocide took place in Sri Lanka. The thing is, it's um, for the Elam Tamils, obviously, it's obvious it's, it's genocide. And if you um, look at the definition of a genocide by the people like uh, Lemkin, who, who, 
who was the one who right formulated this this concept of right genocide according to the rules that he has put forward right i mean this is easily easily i mean it's it's not very hard to prove it's a genocide i mean if you just even say the thing that happened in the last right you know period of the war you know within about 2 3 months period right over 70000 tamil people were killed by right of 100% sinhalese armed forces right now if if you just say those two sentences right mm. within 2 or 3 months this happened about 70000 people were killed right and by Sinhalese people. So, I mean, really, it should not require tribunals and all this analysis mm. to explain what has happened. You know, this is obvious to anybody who who even observes it in a right, simple way, right? So the problem is it's not whether it's true or not. That's not the point, yeah? Mm -hmm. The point is whether it's accepted or not. Exactly. And accepted meaning does it fit into the narrative the the political narrative of the powerful forces in the world right mm -hmm. do they accept it and who is controlling the the powerful uh, you know the narrative in the western world at least you know it's basically the british and the americans they control the narrative about not only about sri lanka but about everything mm -hmm. whether it's uh, the Iraq war, whether it's uh, the Ukraine or whatever, the Chinese or you name it, the I mean, the narrative is controlled by actually two powers, right? The other powers actually have, haven't got much uh, say in it. They follow the US and the British narrative, whether it's in the United Nations, you know, which is supposed to be an important organization, even inside that, even in the United Nations Human Rights Council, I mean, the, the narrative is controlled by the US and the UK. Mm. So basically, it's mm -hmm. a double standards, and if it fits within their narratives, it's okay uh, to yeah. carry out the genocide. Exactly. So that's it. Yeah. So exactly. I, so they they will be, uh, you know, they will be happy to say it's genocide in a country. Say if if the say for example the Rohingyas, you mm -hmm. know, they will they will go for it because the they they feel Myanmar is in the axis of China, Chinese. right? Yeah. So in order to attack the Chinese, they will say it's genocide. Absolutely. In fact, it is a genocidal attack on the Rohingya people. Mm. You know, that is also true. But the thing is, <laughs> uh, Sri Lanka. I mean, you know what I mean. The yeah. the, the what happened in Sri Lanka is uh, how can you accept uh, Rohingya being genocide and not accept? No. Tamil case, it's yeah. ridiculous. You Absolutely. know, you can't, you, you cannot do that. So there must be another reason for it. Absolutely. And and the problem is that the exactly the same people who are controlling the narrative, mm. they happen to be involved in the genocide themselves, mm. right? Then it becomes obvious why they are going to stop this at all costs. You know, because if you prove the genocide and then if you also prove that the british and the americans are involved in it mm. then you know everything is gone you know what i mean they have lost control of the narrative completely and they will not allow that that's the problem yeah absolutely so i want to sort of bring you back into this uh, session so you have done um, extensive <laughs> researches on this uh, specific issue collecting lot evidence witnesses and so on what have you achieved since starting this um, project? I mean, the thing that we tried to do from the start, right? You know, the Tamil people, of course, understand it's genocide. This is not an issue. Yeah. The issue is to get even a little part of the rest of humanity, you know, a little part of the rest of humanity to also to understand this. But the Tamil people have already understood very well, right? Mm -hmm. So we, this is why we went for the Permanent People's Tribunal, because this PPT, which is based in Rome, this has a very good reputation as sort of, it's a ethically based tribunal. Mm -hmm. It comes from the time of the Burton Russell right, Sartre Tribunal on Vietnam, right? So, so this was a sort of, 
ethical examination, right? It didn't have any uh, legal base. You know, it, it was not a court or anything like that. It was an ethical court, if you like, you know? Mm -hmm. and, and so this is the spirit of the PPT, the Permanent People's Tribunal in, in Rome. They are following this uh, Bertrand Russell, John Paul Sartre method, right? They get some experts together who are very uh, honest and have a reputation and we analyze the information and they give a result, right? So we, we did this for Dublin uh, and, and then we went on to Bremen. In the Bremen one, the judges in the tribunal completely accepted that it's genocide and that the US and the UK are complicit. So what we have achieved is actually to get this small part of humanity, you know, a small group, you know, a small group, but who, who has a very good reputation in the world, right? Mm. They have a reputation ranging for many years, 60, 70 years, right? They are incorruptible, ethically based, right? Intellectually rigorous, right? You know, judges who are going to look into the situation. Mm -hmm. So in, in this way, we were able to get some kind of ethical, moral uh, kind of uh, statement from respectable people. So you can say one part of humanity, a small part, even though it's a very small part of humanity, have said, this is what has happened, mm. right? Mm. Now, the problem is uh, that's not really enough, you know? Mm. I mean, these uh, this, uh, really respectable people say something, and then there's a massive pressure, massive sort of power projection from the US and the UK, which controls a narrative in the world, you know, mm. uh, and what chance have we got against this? Absolutely. You know? So yeah. that's the problem that we are trying to solve in this tribe, you know. Mm. We are trying to make it sort of not to break out from this ethical plane mm. into the political plane to yeah. try to engage to get some solidness behind it. I want to take you back to uh, 2006, uh, the, the freedom fight, the Tigers waged the, the war over a number of uh, mm -hmm. decades. Mm -hmm. And um, obviously people have uh, many views, but ultimately the racist attitude towards a tackle from the Sinhalese, the governments, if you like, mm -hmm. and the armed forces ultimately mm -hmm. led to this, the Tamils taking up the arms. And I must say, before the 9-11, the mm -hmm. it was appreciated by many Western countries that tigers were fighting for freedom. As you mm -hmm. obviously know, the, the perception has changed since the 9-11. The in your opinion, who was behind the banning of the LTT back in 2006? Yes, the thing is, um, yeah, uh, the thing about the background of the 9-11 and everything, uh, yeah, that that we 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 our our research and our work and our struggle uh, has shown that it's very it's very little to do with any of that you know this uh, terrorism characterization because you see the peace process despite any view of the ltt of being terrorist or not right we have to accept that the peace process did start Right, so there must, and the peace process was right, supported by a, by the the co-chairs of the peace process, which is Europe, Japan, Norway, and the USA. Right, and and it was supported by actually most of the countries in the world. Nobody nobody said, oh, we are not supporting the uh, Sri Lankan peace process. Everybody supported it. Everybody acknowledged it one way or another, passively or actively, right? So what happened there? If there's, if it's terrorist organization, why are they having a peace process, right? This is what people have to look into it. What happened during the peace process? Why was, why did the peace process start? And more importantly, of course, why did it end? Who started it and who ended it, right? Because it's the end of the peace process. That's the political space, you know, for peace to happen to for the Sinhalese and the Tamils actually to negotiate, to share this sovereignty in this island, right? 
to accept that the sovereignty of the island has to be shared between the two entities, right? And this was moving ahead and it was stopped. So why did it start and why did it stop? This is the central question we are trying to say. And, and it's very little to do with 9-11. Um, you know, people try to say that, oh, it's a 9-11. 9-11 uh, made, um, made the background for the tigers to be painted the same way as, as the others. And because there was this massive war against terror and all these things, this meant that the tigers were, they were marginalized and they were, it's part of this war, war against terror kind of thing. But the thing is what people don't realize it, that the peace process, right? peace process started before 9-11, mm, mm. right? Before 9-11. So, so when people, people try to say, oh, the tigers went to the peace process because they thought, oh my God, that 9-11 is there and there's a war against terror. Let's, uh, let's just go, f go, go humbly to ask for the peace process. That's not what happened, right? The tigers were at their very peak when they went into the peace process. It was after the elephant pass. It was after the Katunaika attack, right? All these massive military victories and the Sri Lankan regime, economically, it was shaking, right? It was really shaking after the, the Katunaika attack. You know, there was militarily, there was, uh, there was a parity, basically. The tigers, you know, the tigers were able to uh, to fight the Sri Lankan state to a standstill, right? And that was that was one of the elements, and this happened before 9-11, of course, right? This opened up the possibility for the peace process to start. And as well as there's been a change in the military balance in Sri Lanka, ex externally also, externally there was a difference. For the first time, the Europeans moved away from the American British line. You know, the Americans and the British have always dominated the, the policy on Sri Lanka, mm. right? Europe always accepted it because it was a British colony and the Americans were the boss, you know? And so uh, the Germans or the Europeans, they always went along with anything, whether it's a Mahaveli project or something, even though they didn't agree with it, they just, just went with it. Right, mm. but after the to run up to the Iraq War, there was a difference in the policy between the EU and the US mm. on war, basically, right? And Germany and Europe wanted peace, right? For their own interests, right? I, I don't have to go into that, but for their own interests, they didn't like the policy put forward by the US and the UK, mm. right? So they they saw Sri Lanka as a perfect place to have peace. Right, because there's a military balance between the Tigers and the government of Sri Lanka, right? Mm. So the peace they had a it's a gambit, yeah, it's a peace gambit, you know. Mm. Uh, the peace gambit they put against the policy of the U.S. and the U.K. Right, and the LTT understanding this, right, that this was internationally a very good situation for them, mm. right? They had the. Uh, uh, the unilateral ceasefire, right, several times, right, the, in order to say we are willing to go into peace talks, mm. right? Mm. And the unilateral ceasefire also happened before the 9 11. So, yeah. I mean, unless you think that the 9 11 was always also organized by the Tigers, uh, you, you couldn't, how could the Tigers know what 9 11 is going to happen? Absolutely. Right? The, so the yeah. ceasefire agreement yeah. happened yeah. before, right? Yeah. And what did the British do when the Tigers went for the ceasefire? They had a unilateral ceasefire. Mm. What the British did was they right, to ban the Tigers. They had not banned the tigers before. Yeah. They banned the tigers exactly at the time they went for peace talks, right? Yeah. Because they they and the Americans did not want the peace talks to succeed from the very beginning, from the inception, yeah. right? They didn't want it to be even born, right? But the Germans and the Europeans pushed it forward, right? And so clearly it demonstrates their hidden agenda. So 
From the European yes. Union perspective, you know, what made them supporting this ban? Clearly the terror listing of the LTT, was it instigated by British and the US or? Yeah, yeah. The terror listing of the, uh, the, the EU was the final straw, you know, mm. that broke the back, you know, the, of the peace process. There were two other main, there was a, actually hundreds of attacks on the peace process by the Americans and the British. But the main two things were the so-called Washington episode, right? Mm. Where, where the LTT was not allowed to attend a meeting from from the aid donors you know there was a, a pre meeting of the aid donors yes. and they had the meeting in washington right mm. that meant that the ltt cannot come because the ltt is banned Bando. in the usa mm. so the usa used the fact that they had banned it mm. right in order to stop and force the meeting to happen in washington right and anton balasingham said uh, well the peace talks have become too internationalized, yeah. right? He didn't actually blame the government of Sri Lanka because the government of Sri Lanka had nothing to do with it. The peace talks were going quite well, actually, mm. at that time, right? Mm. But the Americans were horrified at the peace talks. Uh, peace talks were going really well because the the problem was if, if the peace talks were to succeed, right, mm. it is quite possible that the Sinhalese, right, are going to come into a deal with the tigers and the tigers will, will gain control of uh, Trincomalee Harbour. And the tigers have always said they will never allow Trincomalee Harbour to be used for, for military purposes by any external power. Mm -hmm. Right Now, <laughs> this, this was uh, com completely unacceptable for, for the USA yes. because the USA needed to use this exactly for the purpose of militarily projecting power in the Middle East, mm. for the war that was starting in Iraq at that time, right? And also to attack Iran also. You know, if you want to attack Iran or China for that matter, it's very necessary to have this harbor. Strategically, uh, yes, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. If not, you cannot win. To win wars, you know, when the Portuguese rule the country, they had the harbor. When they ruled the world, I mean, they did not rule the whole world, but when they were dominant power, right, in the world, they had Trincomalee, mm. right? When the Dutch became, they overthrew the Portuguese to become become the dominant power, they had Trincomalee. Mm. When the British, 150 years later, when they became the, the dominant power in the world, they had Trincomalee. In mm. fact, the British fought against the French uh, and 100 ships, I think something like 100 ships were lost in Trincomalee Harbour between the French and the British mm -hmm. because they knew that this is the key to controlling the Indian Ocean region, mm. right? which was very important for the British. Right? Yeah. And now who's the big power in the world? Yeah. It's the Americans. Mm. And they, they also, as it happens, they need also to Trincomalee Harbour, mm. right? And that's what it's all about. And that's why, whether even if the Sinhalese wanted to, uh, to, to allow autonomy for the Tamils, the Americans just wouldn't let them. Yeah. Because if the Tamils have autonomy, of any kind of autonomy, and right, they, they have already said that yeah. they will not allow mm -hmm. it to be used as a military post to attack any other country. Yeah. Whatever yeah. people might say about Prabhakaran, right, yeah. one thing is, that what he says, he usually means, mm. right? And when he said that you cannot, we, we, we will not allow this to be used by anybody. And this is a Indian Ocean's zone of peace. Mm. You know, the LTT pledged that it will be a zone of peace. They're not against economic activities from people, but militarily, it cannot be used to attack any other country. Yeah. So you have clearly outlined um, a lot of the things here, how the superpowers, uh, they were trying mm -hmm. to manipulate this in a, such a way that uh, they want to dominate the strategical area of the Indian Ocean. Banning the, the LTT, in your opinion, mm -hmm. paved the way for the genocidal war against the, the Tamils, was it? And basically orchestrated by the superpower, including India. Yes, the thing is, yeah, India is another, it's a complicated story with India uh, because India at one time, they, 
support of the Tamil struggle actually mm. right it's a complicated story because they they move from being pro Tamil to being anti Tamil right at a certain point you know and that's also to do with the geopolitical equation you know they they used to be for this Indian Ocean red zone of peace when it was in their interest they didn't want the Americans to come in so they right, supported the Tamils mm. right but when this the Soviet Union collapsed and the Americans came together with India against the Chinese you know when they made an alliance against the Chinese right then india changed its position slowly begin to change its position from the time that the soviet union was slowly falling right so india has a complicated role to play mm. and it's still playing a very <laughs> complicated game in in this region but what's not complicated is the us and the uk especially the U- us is very clear right you know we, the difference also between the the bremen tribunal and our tribunal here in berlin is that we have got a lot of information right mm. which which can prove right exactly how the peace process was step by step destroyed mm-hmm. right mm-hmm. we have especially the wikileaks cables right yeah. which is really quite incredible you know the americans went from one country to another you know for for the european union the european union did not want to ban the ltt mm. they were completely against banning the ltt right but the americans went to each and every country right to say to them please we want you to ban the ltt mm. right they said no they said no and then they went again again they did another round and they twisted their arm basically mm-hmm. to force them one by one because if one eu country said no the ban would not have happened mm. so the americans had to get every eu country 26 of them of course the british help right because they were working hand in hand with the americans and they forced because the eu has had been uh, they didn't want the war to start right mm. they wanted the peace talks to succeed so as long as the eu is right, supporting the peace talks it's very difficult to start the war so the americans had to first destroy the eu before they could destroy the the ltt yeah, so the e- eu was the thing that was holding back mm. holding back the genocide for four years during the peace process they they pushed the americans back for four years but as you know about whether it's iraq war or ukraine or what wherever you want to say yeah. right i mean the europeans are not able to stand up against the americans yeah. for long absolutely they will stand up for a short while yeah. and then they fall yeah and it's when they fell that's when the gates of hell was open oh. for the elam tamils yeah. Yeah. right when they fell right so this is what we want to explain properly so that you see because in europe there are people who tried to stop this mm-hmm. right the problem is at that time we didn't mobilize them properly yeah. right we were doing our, our demonstrations but we didn't connect with the uh, the powerful forces in yeah. europe mm. who were already against the american policy yeah. right but they were working in a in 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 a diplomatic way yeah. right we were going on the street right they were working in a diplomatic way we had to connect with them yeah. and that we didn't do right this is also yeah. i am also at fault we are all at fault at that yeah. because we thought you know the, it can it's a backfire also you know yeah, yeah. so the the thing is uh, now also it's possible to mobilize these forces yeah. they are still there yeah. you know yeah. the tigers have been destroyed but the e- eu people who supported the peace process they are not dead you know yeah. they are still alive yeah. you know they are around you know they are not so powerful as they were before yeah. because they have been pushed out of the government circles right some of them uh, like the main people who who push for the peace talks to begin in germany yeah. she is now out of politics you know she she's yeah. she's really important person for the peace talks but she's out of politics yeah and the people who right supported the ban of the ltt in germany you know he's actually the president of germany Steinmeier mm. right and he's also involved with the 
Ukraine thing as well, right? So these forces can be mobilized, you know, if we explain the thing properly to them. And if the Tamil diaspora has has an understanding of what's going on and how to do things properly, as, right? If they understand yeah, it, then yeah. it's engage, possible. As you say, they engage with the right stakeholders, would mobilize us in the right direction. Exactly. And I would like to wrap up the interview with Mr. Viraj Mendes. What is the end game? And what are we expecting from this tribunal? Yeah, well, <laughs> the the thing, one of the important, there's two two important developments that have happened, which we want to push it further, right? Mm -hmm. One development is that in Latin America, the indigenous people in Ecuador, right? Mm -hmm. They made, for the first time as a community, they recognized the genocide, right? As a community. So that's, I think, the first time a full community of people, not politicians here and there, mm -hmm. but a full community of people accepted the genocide, right? Mm -hmm. They understood it. And they wanted to, so we want to develop this. It happened in Ecuador. Now we have moved it in many Latin American countries because the indigenous people understand genocide because it's happened to them before, Yeah. right? Yeah. The Western powers came and destroyed their lands 500 years ago, but they still remember it, you know. Yeah. <laughs> Unfortunately, some Tamil people have already forgotten what has happened in Mulivaika, right? Mm. But the indigenous people, they remember for 500 years ago what happened to them. And they see the same thing for the Tamils. They see the character of the genocide is the same, you know, yeah. all the time. So that's one thing we want to develop. That's mm. why the a lot of the judges are from the indigenous uh, communities, right? Yeah. That's one thing. And the other thing is, a uh, very interesting thing happened last year. One of the people, the diaspora activist, right, who collected money for the movement during the war period and before, right, who are being accused, you know, and they are they will be charged for the crime of collecting money, right? He took a position that he's not going to accept that he's guilty. He's mm -hmm. not going to accept the charge as being guilty. Right. Mm. This is actually it's a, it's a very it seems like a very small thing, but actually nobody has done that up till now. Yeah. Mm. Every diaspora person, right? In in Germany, there's probably about a hundred people who have been charged with this. They have all said in the courtroom, "Yes, we are guilty. We accept the punishment." Mm. Right. But last year, this person called Nadan Tambi, he took a position that he's he's going to plead that he's not guilty, mm. that he didn't do anything wrong to collect money for the LTT. Mm. And that's a proud thing he did. And he doesn't accept that the law that is being used to charge him has any legitimacy because the law which is used against him, right, in a small way, right, a small small amount of fine he'll have to pay or he'll, have, he'll get a suspended sentence, something like that. This law that is used against him was used to start the genocide. So he's saying, no, I'm not guilty. You are guilty. You have, you have unleashed genocide with this same law that yeah. you're using against me. You expect me to say, yes, I'm, I accept it. Mm. That means I'm accepting the logic of the genocide as yeah. well. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So this person has started this I went to the court case uh, last week, actually. Last week, the court case started, right? And the court case is now going. And what we want to do is to address this issue of the EU ban itself. We are not only saying, I mean, to lift the ban, because to lift the ban now, it's a little bit too late. You know, you're closing the gate after the horse has bolted, right? So it, it's not lifting the ban we are talking about. We are saying, the ban was responsible for genocide, mm. right? It's a it's a crime against peace. You triggered the war, right? So therefore, you're guilty of a huge crime, the biggest crime in the world, mm. which is genocide, yeah. right? So we want to sort of uh, this stand. It looks like a simple stand mm. that uh, Nadan Tambi has is is making. We want to extend this also. And the tribunal is also doing these two things. One is the 
to mobilize the indigenous people's organizations all over the world, right? And there's a lot, there's a lot of indigenous people around in the world, you know, and to get them to put moral pressure, right, on the international community, mm -hmm. right? And then also for the Tamil diaspora to take a completely new line to not to collaborate with this law, right? To oppose it completely. Mm. Say, if you want to put me in jail, put me in jail, but I will never accept I did anything wrong mm. by helping the people, yeah. right? In fact, the law that you're using is what made me have to collect the money for the tigers, mm. because if not, you know what I mean? Mm. The, war, <laughs> the, war, the war wouldn't have been no. even started no. if you hadn't done this, yeah. you know? So we want to try to turn this around. So these two things are, are things we we are we think are practically is going to come out mm. of the, the tribunal. Yeah. Although it's both are in their infancy, you yeah. know, because mm. the Thambi case is just a few months old, yeah. and the and the thing from the indigenous people also few years old. Mm. But I think now after all this time after genocide, it's about time to start to turn things around, mm. completely around, not to compromise, you know, Absolutely. and not, not to have these lobbies and things like that, you know, you go and speak with uh, David Cameron and have a cup of tea mm -hmm. and you think you have achieved something, yeah. right? Yeah. That That's not, you know, you're, you're not lobbying them, they're lobbying you, yeah. right? Yeah. They're lobbying you, that's yeah. what's happening. Mm. We, we want to have people who are uncompromisingly, right, supporting our positions, mm. right? about the liberation movement, about the right to self-determination, the, the right to have arms against a genocidal state. This is a human right. You know, even yeah. in the United Nations, it says, if you are suffering or if you are being facing a genocidal attack, you have the right to take up arms to stop it, to stop the genocide, especially if nobody else in the world is helping yeah. you. You have the right to use arms to stop the genocide. So this is even legally, there's a basis for it. And we should not, you know, when people fight the LTT ban, right? Even the way they fight the LTT ban is against the LTT. Mm. Because one of the arguments they're using is everybody who's used the, the arguments uh, to, to lift the LTT ban up till now, they all use the argument that the LTT is gone. Mm. LTT is gone. So why are you having this ban to criminalize the diaspora? The LTT is gone already, and it's not coming up anytime soon, mm. right? 13 years, it's not there, right? So why are you having this ban to criminalize us and our children and to, right? But the thing what people <laughs> don't seem to understand, the obvious thing, is if you use the fact that the LTT is gone as a positive thing for you, mm. Right, well, to win something yeah. by the fact that the LTT is gone. That's so. Therefore, LTT is gone. Therefore, leave me alone. Yeah. That it, is saying it's a good thing that the LTT is gone. Yeah. Right. But, we want to completely work against this. Basically, it's convenient uh, for them. So it, it's all depending on whether everything falls within their agenda. If it does, yes, yeah. they will do so. If not, exactly what they have done. They will continue to do it. Mr. Viraj Mendes, it's been an absolute pleasure talking to you. And uh, you have really given us a lot of information here that, um, and especially coming from you as a single as you mentioned at the top of the, the interview. And it's been really refreshing uh, listening to you. On behalf of ILC Tamil Radio listeners, may I take this opportunity to thank you very much for spending the time with me for the last 45 minutes and um, wish you all the best and I hope that you continue to contribute to achieve the, the goals that you set at the beginning. So wish you all the best and um, we'll catch up 